All right, so it is one minute after seven, and um, or at least on the eastern uh, east coast here. I want to go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to welcome everyone uh, to the final of the four AHNS tours webinars, um, and this obviously is leading up to our big international meeting next week, uh, which we would have actually, you know, hoped to be in person, but um, hopefully we'll have a lot of engagement online next week. Uh, so a few uh, housekeeping items before we get started. Um, tonight's webinar is being recorded um, and many of you may be watching the recording um, after this, uh, which is great. Um, tell your friends about it, uh, pass it around. Um, there is a chat function uh, at the bottom. And so I'm gonna be monitoring the chat function throughout the, the course of the hour here. And if you have any questions or comments, you know, please write um, uh, any, anything in there and I can review that. And if you have a particular speaker that you wanna direct it to, then uh, please let me know. Um, first uh, and foremost, I wanna give uh, big thanks uh, to the AHNS staff, uh, particularly to Christine and Nicole, uh, whom without we could not have done this. This takes an incredible amount of work and uh, we are indebted uh, to, to our AHNS staff. And also um, this uh, could not have been done without the generous support of Intuitive Surgical. Uh, who really stepped up. And one person in particular that I wanna name is Sharice Nevins, who has been a longtime supporter of us in the head and neck community and um, has really gone to great lengths to make this webinar possible. Uh, so first I wanna welcome our panelists. Uh, so I'm just gonna go down the line here. Um, so tonight we're joined by uh, Dr. Carol Lewis, a head and neck surgeon from MD Anderson. Uh, from uh, uh, Oregon Health Sciences, Dr. Daniel Clayberg, a head and neck surgeon. Uh, we have Allison Holman, who is a speech and language pathologist uh, at Mass General Hospital. And finally, Andrew Holcomb, a head and neck surgeon at, um, at Nebraska Methodist Hospital in Creighton um, Medical School. So um, as you know from watching these previous webinars, we've been doing a lot of discussing about who and when uh, to perform tours, how to decide on adjuvant therapy, um, how to de-escalate, and future trends. And tonight we're gonna to be discussing what I really consider to be one of the most basic elements of TORS, which is just caring for the patient, getting these patients to surgery and safely beyond surgery and recovered. And admittedly, I think this is a topic that we've given very little attention to. You know, when I started doing TORS well over a decade ago, you know, we were all over the map. Some people were keeping patients in the hospital for well over a week, patients were getting NG tubes, um, some were told not to leave town uh, out of fear of a bleed. Uh, and we really didn't uh, you know, have much of an idea in, and, uh, as to how to best manage uh, these patients postoperatively. So tonight the question is, have we evolved over the years? Have we developed an evidence base on how to best, best manage these patients? So that's what we're gonna be exploring. And I wanna start uh, the discussion here uh, with an audience question. Uh, which we could go ahead and bring up. Uh, so this is for everyone here. At my current institution, we have a well-defined post-operative care pathway for TORS patients. And the answers are yes, no, not sure, or depends, meaning, well, we have you know three different TOR surgeons and each one does their different protocol or sometimes we do it, but other times we don't, et cetera. So the numbers are ticking in. We're gonna wait a few more seconds here. And I believe that um, you may not be able to see this if you're watching the recorded version. So I'm gonna read it off here. Um, so we have about an equal split, perfectly equal right now, 35% yes, 35% no, and about 20% not sure, and 14% depends. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to Andrew Holcomb, who's gonna Tell us about the current lay of the landscape for this. All right, can you see my slides? All right, thank you for the introduction and uh, for the opportunity to participate in this webinar series. Uh, as Dr. Richmond said, I'm gonna talk about the current landscape of perioperative care for transoral robotic surgery. Let's see if I can, there we go. I have no disclosures. Uh, so I'll present results of a recent American Head and Neck Society survey on practice patterns in transoral robotic surgical patients and explore supporting evidence where it exists for current perioperative practice patterns. 
we administered a cross-sectional survey uh, to clinical fellows and program directors among 49 AHNS fellowships. And we accepted a single response per each institution. And we intended to ask questions related to practices specific to TORS resection of oropharyngeal tumors and ask participants to highlight the most common practices at their institution. Uh, we asked questions about uh, general respondent characteristics, such as institutional surgical volume, number of TOR surgeons per institution, their surgical platforms that were used. We asked about medical management, including antibiotics, VTE prophylaxis, steroids and pain control. We asked about dietary management, including involvement of speech language pathologists, utilization of feeding tubes. We asked a few questions about disposition planning, and then we asked several questions about operative decision making and patient selection that will not be presented tonight. Uh, survey respondents, we had 38 responses for a 78% response rate. The mean number of TOR surgeons per institution was 3.7 with a range of 1, point, uh, 1 to 7. And standardized institutional protocols were used at only 45% of centers. So this highlights that there's not only inter-institutional variability, but also potentially uh, variability between surgeons at an institution, and that may not fully be captured with the survey. But again, we asked uh, the respondents to indicate the most common practices at their institution. 92% of the uh, centers had at least 10 TORS cases annually, and 60% had greater than 25 TORS cases annually. And unsurprisingly, the DaVinci platforms were the most common and the DaVinci SI was overall the most common. Several institutions did have access to multiple surgical platforms. In terms of antibiotic therapy, the most common was ampicillin sulbactam or unison monotherapy. The second to this was uh, ANSEF and Flagyl. Uh, the most common overall duration was 24 hours. You can see that one institution said that they did not use antibiotics at all. Uh, there were also 21% of respondents that uh, used preoperative antibiotics only, and 13% that used antibiotics for 72 hours or greater. There is some uh, literature on infection rates in TORS patients. This is a series out of Memorial of 122 patients, and they found a 9% overall neck infection rate after TORS, uh, including one grade four infection. There is not specific literature uh, in terms of comparative studies within TORS patients alone, but there is uh, a number of studies or are a number of studies on clean contaminated head and neck surgery. And this systematic review included 39 studies and found that uh, ANSEF, Unison, and amoxicillin clavulanate or Augmentin were most effective uh, as uh, infection prevention relative to placebo. They also compared regimens greater than 48 hours to regimens of 48 hours or less and found that those longer regimens did not reduce the risk of wound infection. The forest plot below uh, compares ampicillin sulbactam, which was found to be the most effective, to clindamycin monotherapy. And they found an odds ratio of 2.7 for patients receiving clinda, suggesting that clinda monotherapy was inferior uh, to unison. This is a, a meta-analysis that involves 340 patients among four randomized control trials. They found a pooled relative risk of surgical site infection of 0.98 in patients receiving one day versus five days of antibiotics and concluded that 24 hours of antibiotics was appropriate for clean contaminated head and neck surgery. So you can see from these studies that clindamycin monotherapy is likely inferior. None of their respondents selected this as their preferred regimen. Uh, and also that longer duration of antibiotics, at least in clean contaminated head and neck surgery uh, as a whole, is likely unnecessary and that somewhere in that 24 to 48 hour range is likely appropriate. Moving on to pain control, multimodal analgesia or use of two or greater pain uh, 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 medicines uh, was pretty ubiquitous, 95% of centers. Mm -hmm. Opiates were the most commonly prescribed medication or commonly used and Tylenol was a close second. Uh, NSAIDs, interestingly, were used at only 12 centers, so clearly there is concern among the respondents about potential toxicities, potentially as they relate to uh, risk of hemorrhage. And steroids were used in some capacity at 82% of centers. You can see also gabapentin and topical agents were relatively uncommon. Uh, steroids were most commonly used for 24 hours or less. 19% used them preoperatively only. 18% uh, did not use them at all, and another 16% used them for, for uh, greater than 24 hours, whether inpatient or even upon discharge. I'll comment a bit about uh, opiates, and Dr. Claybrook's presentation, of course, will go into greater detail. 
Uh, surgeons are the second most common opiate prescribers, second only to pain medicine physicians. Uh, and we know that the risk uh, of addiction uh, and uh, uh, diversion is relatively significant. A single post-operative opiate prescription in one study was shown to increase the risk of opiate dependence at one year by 44%. Uh, this study on the right, uh, you can see that surgeon prescriptions actually have decreased uh, at the end of this study period that terminated in 2012, uh, suggesting that we may be making progress on this front. However, uh, uh, prescribing patterns are very variable. Uh, in the survey at the top of 35 residents in the New York area, they found that residents prescribed uh, a wide range of opiates, ranging from an average of four narcotic pills to 21 narcotic pills per procedure. And so this really highlights the need to have an evidence-based approach to prescribing these dangerous medications and also uh, to having standardized uh, protocols within an institution. Residents are not the only uh, of us to blame. Uh, we can see that there are other factors that influence prescribing behavior and associations in this study on the Medicare population below suggest that male uh, prescribers, those in the Midwest and mid-career physicians were the most likely to prescribe higher amounts of opiates. Moving on to VTE prophylaxis, 100% uh, of the surveyed centers said that they would use mechanical prophylaxis and about three quarters would use pharmacologic prophylaxis as well. Uh, conversely, 90% reported that they would require stopping therapeutic anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy before surgery. When asked how long they would hold that therapy after surgery if they weren't uh, you know, coerced by the hematologists or cardiologists to do otherwise, the most common response was between days two and seven, that was 51%. An additional 13% said they would restart the medications on day one. Uh, and only 36% would hold these medications for greater than one week. This is another uh, systematic review and meta-analysis by Stokes et al., looking at factors affecting bleeding rates in TORS. They included 299 patients on therapeutic anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy and found a relative risk uh, of 2.25, so about double the uh, risk of hemorrhage in patients on therapeutic anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy. And they found in their study that the median time to hemorrhage was eight days among 332 total hemorrhage events. So uh, it's possible that patients that are restarting therapeutic anticoagulation on post-operative day one or two may be at increased risk for hemorrhage when the events are happening on average at day eight. These two studies look at uh, VTE prophylaxis, so not therapeutic anticoagulation, but prophylaxis alone. Uh, the study at the top had a very large number of patients undergoing a variety of otolaryngology procedures, and the incidence of ET was low at 0.4% and bleeding complications at 0.9%. We know that bleeding rates in TORS are significantly higher, 5 to 10% on average, uh, and that chemoprophylaxis in this study did not result in a decreased risk of VTE, but did result in an increased risk of bleeding with an odds ratio of protein four. So this is certainly concerning when we're talking about a procedure that's among the highest risk of bleeding and catastrophic bleeding. Although again, with the median time to bleed of eight days, it's unclear whether prophylaxis in that brief hospital stay on day one or two has any influence on an event that happens in a delayed fashion. Uh, the study below by Kramer et al. reviewed 29 articles. And they recommended dual prophylaxis, so both mechanical and pharmacologic prophylaxis in patients with a Caprini score of seven or greater. And so they really advocate for a personalized approach comparing the patient's relative risk of VTE to their relative risk of bleeding. Preoperative involvement of speech language pathologists was common. 56% said they would always have SLP see the patients and another 29% in at least some conditional circumstance the remaining 15% said seldom or never. Instrumental swallow evaluations were used in about 50% of centers and patient reported outcome measures, such as the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory, similarly used at about 50% of centers. The uh, responses about feeding tubes were split. About 50% would place them proactively in most or all patients, and the remaining 50% uh, would place them either in few patients or reactive only. Uh, proponents of proactive placement uh, cite that it's a safer uh, and easier placement in a patient under anesthesia, worry potentially about inducing bleeding or significant pain postoperatively, 
and those that advocate for a reactive approach uh, cite the low overall rate of need for a nasogastric tube placement and the potential impairment on swallow function that a patient may have with a nasogastric tube. There was a more consensus on gastrostomy tube placement. Almost 90% said that they would reactively place these uh, only after discharge uh, in their standard setting. Postoperatively, uh, most patients return to an oral diet after a swallow evaluation, either on day one or in a delayed fashion. However, 37% uh, said that they would return to uh, oral diet without any swallow evaluation and either not use a swallow evaluation at all or do that after a return to an oral diet. The bedside SLP evaluation was the most common testing method at 83%. And swallowing exercises were used at 95% of centers in some capacity. So these were very ubiquitous. The most common discharge diets were uh, soft diet or liquid or puree. Uh, one institution was comfortable with a regular diet. Uh, and of course, a couple um, uh, prefer to use tube feeding at discharge. Repeat swallow evaluations, again, a split. About 50% would always do this and about 50% only in select circumstances or uh, seldom or never. And finally, disposition planning. The median earliest discharge day was post-op day one uh, with a mean of 1.6, and the median length of stay was two days with a mean of 2.5. Uh, you can see the patient disposition that was the most common was either a floor or step-down unit. Uh, a few institutions are sending these patients to the ICU, and one institution expressed comfort with same-day surgery discharge for TORS patients. I'll highlight one study. Uh, this is from sort of early in the TORS era. Uh, this included 641 patients undergoing TORS and found a mean length of stay of 3.7 days. And so based on uh, this recent report, we've cut about a day and a half off of that mean. Take-home points that perioperative practice patterns vary in the care of TORS patients and that there are relatively few direct comparisons of specific perioperative practices in TORS patients. This represents an opportunity for us to build an evidence base and, and try to see how we can take better care of these patients. I'd like to thank my co-contributors uh, to uh, the survey that was administered. Uh, for those that are interested, you can see the full results next Friday uh, in the scientific session at 1 p.m. And I'd like to thank the American Head and Neck Society for putting on uh, this great series of webinars and to Intuitive for their financial support. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, great presentation. You know, I think it, it's interesting because we see that there's relative agreement on things that we can extrapolate from other areas of head and neck surgery, like antibiotics and opioid use. You had about 90% of people agreeing on the same thing. But those elements that are most particular to TORS, uh, including bleeding and swallowing and SLP involvement was really, you know, at best 50% engagement on that. And the rest were kind of all over the place, including about 10% of programs being very aggressive, it looked like on G-tube placement, which is pretty surprising. So um, I think it tells us a lot about where we're at now. Um, let's bring up our next audience response question here. Okay, uh, so there we go. Okay, so at my current institution, we employ ERAS protocols for one, major head and neck recon, two, TORS cases, three, all or, or both, four, none, and five, what's ERAS? So we have a about 50% of people have answered here. We're gonna give it a few more seconds. Five seconds. All right, let's end it there. And so I think this is really interesting. I'm gonna see if this pops up for the rest of the group. Uh, so most programs, if they do have ERAS, it's for head and neck recon. 48% uh, of programs, only one program has a TORS ERAS program. Um, I, actually, I'm sorry, that's incorrect. There's four because um, there's um, three programs that do both head and neck and TORS. And then um, as you can see, 20% uh, that do none and uh, four participants that are gonna have to listen to Carol Lewis's talk very closely on what ERAS is. All right, over to you, Carol. All right, let's see, continue. 
All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Carol Lewis. Let me get my slides up. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about enhanced recovery after surgery, which is what ERAS stands for, um, and the role in perioperative tours care. Um, let me see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Okay, so <clears throat> every good talk starts with a historical slide. So a history of ERAS. So in 2001, a group of academic general surgeons created an evidence-based care protocol for elective colectomy. And what they were looking to do was translate, put evidence into practice. That was sort of their motto. Um, they wanted multi-professional engagement in all phases of perioperative care. And they came up with this acronym ERAS, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. In 2010, they formed a formal society, a nonprofit international medical society. And the full name is Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society for Perioperative Care. This entered the head and neck realm in 2016. It was ePubbed by Joe Dort. Um, and he, this paper, um, um, was a systematic review of many different recommendations. They actually had 24 recommendations um, for an ERAS protocol for head and neck cancer surgery with free flap reconstruction. Although I have to say the vast majority of these recommendations were borrowed from evidence from other fields. It should come as no surprise to anybody. Um, so when we put our program together, and I'm going to go through our head and neck surgery free flap reconstruction program fairly quickly and then get into what we know about TORS programs um, or evidence for TORS components. Um, so we decided to focus on our head and neck surgery patients having free flaps. It's about 30 patients per month. We thought highest, in, uh, re most resource intense patients where we'll see the most benefit. We devised the program um, with a panel of head and neck surgeons, plastic and reconstructive surgeons um, at our uh, uh, medicals at our center, they're two separate. So plastics does our free flops for us um, and anesthesia. Um, we also had guidance. We were late to the game at our institution. So they had already built goal-directed fluid al uh, therapy algorithms um, and decreased and protocols for decreased intraoperative opioids. And then we chose components from existing literature and guidelines. So these are general components of an enhanced recovery program. The blue arrows signify what we implemented. I'm gonna go through what we didn't because I'm gonna get into the other stuff later. So what we didn't do, we didn't reduce preoperative fasting and we didn't institute preoperative carbohydrate loading. And the main reason was our head and neck anesthesiologists were like, your patients are at a high enough risk for aspiration without causing, giving them these other reasons to aspirate. So they kind of nixed that um, and you know, we'll just see what the literature bears out over time. Carbohydrate loading in general has sort of fallen out of favor in a lot of ERAS protocols. Um, the benefit has not necessarily been proven. Um, Post-operative nausea prophylaxis is done on an as-needed basis. It's not something that we've built in um, as a standing order. Um, and post-operative protein carbohydrate supplements, um, I actually nix that one because patients would be paying for that out of pocket. And since a lot of our patients can barely afford the gas to get to their doctor's appointments, let alone their surgeries, I did not feel that that was an okay thing to mandate. Um, we don't use routine laxative or prokinetics. Again, that's something that's better suited for the general surgery population. Okay, so four phases of perioperative care, pre, intra, post, op, and then follow up. Preoperatively, we have um, pamphlets, booklets of patient for patient education. We designate surgeries as enhanced recovery. We call it enhanced surgical recovery because everyone has to have their own acronym at our institution. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we limit sedatives. And then our pre-op medications that they get in pre-op holding, gabapentin, Celebrex, Tremadol ER, and Tylenol. Um, intraoperatively, goal-directed fluid therapy, opioid sparing anesthesia, <laughs> normothermia, and increased FiO2. Again, kind of vague, what's your goal? It's just increased for FiO2. Hopefully we all practice good hemostasis and we really try to adhere to transfusion protocols. Um, we don't send our patients to the ICU only for medical necessity, not because they had a free flap. Um, we do practice early mobilization. They want, we want them out of bed post-op day one. We get the urinary catheter out post-op day one, um, post-operative fluid limitation. Um, and then we have standing gabapentin, tremadol, and Celebrex. And then post-operatively, obviously we wanna coordinate follow-up and support. 
when we looked at um, how we were, how we did, or how, what, what the benefits of our program were, we looked at um, we did two cohorts, case match, case matched analysis, um, 200 patients in each arm, and found significantly reduced rate of ICU stay, mean length of stay, mean morphine equivalence over 72 hours, and uh, decreased rate of overall complications. And um, the group from Penn put out a very nice systematic review and meta-analysis looking at head and neck surgery with free flop reconstruction e ERAS protocols internationally, and also found <clears throat> consistently reduced hospital length of stay, rates of readmission, and wound complications with no difference in ICU length of stay, unplanned reoperation, re or mortality. Okay, I'm just gonna take a sip of water. So, what, what components can we put in that are, would be TOR specific? And this is where it gets a little difficult as you all probably know your own literature pretty well. Um, but a lot of it is retrospective, um, smaller case series or cohorts. So, um, so interoperatively, there's a, a paper of 363 uh, patients, retrospective case control study. And what they did was they looked at recovery times and they split them into quartiles and they took the highest quartile, that's the prolonged recovery quartile, um, from anesthesia after TORS for oral pharynx cancer. And they found that it was associated with isoflurane use, midazolam, larger opioid doses, and also with less anti-emetic prophylaxis. And so what this speaks to is the need for opioid sparing anesthesia um, if you want to increase or improve the recovery of your patients, um, as well as anti-emetic protocols. So it supports it. It's not really direct evidence for an ERAS protocol, but again, this is where we're going to be pulling our uh, data from. Um, two papers looking at with two different perspectives on um, opioid use. So uh, a retrospective cohort study of 138 patients um, used the state prescription authority to look at uh, prolonged opioid use and found that after TORS, it was associated with adjuvant therapy. That makes sense, right? Postoperative radiation or concurrent chemo radiation and a higher frailty index. And that's important because it helps you find a target population or a population that may benefit most from opioid reducing strategies such as multimodal analgesia. Um, important to note at 12 months post-op, they found 4% were still using opioids. So definitely room for improvement there. Um, TORS for, so the, uh, the other paper is um, from a group in Denmark. So what they did was they instituted a multimodal analgesia, analgesia protocol and found that their TORS patients um, who are undergoing cancer surgeries reported pain scores similar to adults undergoing bilateral tonsillectomy. Um, and those tonsillectomies were done for diagnostic purposes. So it wasn't like chronically infected people. Um, and so the difference though, is that they actually didn't look at morphine equivalents, even though they had this multimodal analgesia protocol, they only looked at pain scores. So again, um, comp kind of two different perspectives um, and you try to make of it what you can. Um, for diet, retrospective chart review of 138 patients found a rate of feeding tube placement perioperatively of 3.6%. So um, I really think this speaks to careful patient selection for feeding tube placement. And a complementary study to this um, showed that an oral diet could be restarted. We just heard about this also 1.26 days with resultant rapid discharge. Um, and that was a study of 91 patients. A longer time to oral intake was associated with base of tongue resections for sleep apnea. And a longer length of stay was associated with a longer time to oral intake, makes sense, um, and as, as well as comorbidities. So again, things to think about as you start putting together a protocol in your um, institution or looking at your own protocols. There is a public, a published um, ERAS for TORS pathway out of uh, um, Rush. And um, I just highlighted a few components here. This is the, uh, their protocol. It's in their paper. It's definitely worth looking at. Um, they do use a carbohydrate drink. It's called carbohydrate loading three hours prior to anesthesia. They use um, gabapentin and Tylenol in the pre-op holding area interoperatively, um, opioid sparing anesthesia, goal-directed fluid therapy, prophylactic antiemetics, postoperatively standing gabapentin, celecoxib, and Tylenol, fentanyl PCA for opioid tolerant patients. Um, they do get a dietitian consult with tube feeds. They kind of imply that tube feeding was fairly standard for their patients. Um, and in that, I would add that if you are going to put 
Tylenol and tube feeds together, just know that Tylenol suspension has a really high um, con uh, sorbitol content and your patients will get diarrhea, not from the tube feeds, but from the Tylenol. So learn from my experience and don't let your patients learn from yours. Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, and then their, their patients were discharged on gabapentin Tylenol and celecoxib um, and old narcotics only if they use them prior to discharge. Okay. So they, their cohorts were small. ERAS over three, over a year and a half of their ERAS program, 19 patients. And then they did a, a historical cohort of the time before that for 26 patients. Um, primary outcomes, they saw a significant reduction in mean morphine equivalent doses over 72 hours post-op, a reduction in um, pain scores, DVPRS are pain scores, um, the number receiving narcotics on discharge. And then for secondary outcomes, they saw a quicker time to post-op day of ambulation, although it's kind of close. It's 0.9 days versus 1.3. Um, and a significantly lower number of patients requiring narcotic refills within 30 days post-op. And this is pretty significant, 5.3% in the ERAS cohort um, versus 48% historically. Um, so enhanced recovery programs require, require multidisciplinary engagement through all phases and levels of care. Uh, most protocols pull from a set of known best practices in other fields, in our field, um, and based on the best available data. Um, you then tailor these recommendations much as we did to fit our institutional resources and culture. Um, you can look through procedure specific literature on perioperative care to also get components for your pathway. Um, and um, obviously components for tour specific programs are still being determined. Um, and I just wanted to highlight with this thank you slide that it really does require engagement on all levels and in through all phases of care. Um, it's really your program won't fly unless you have that. Um, if you're interested in setting up a program and you're not sure where to start, um, feel free to email me. Um, I've been through it and I probably made all of the mistakes you could ever make in setting one up. So thank you. Wonderful. Carol, thank you so much. Um, so exciting to see that the first TORS pathway, ERS pathway is out there from Rush and we're hoping to see a lot of others and um, try and again get the best evidence medicine out there to help guide our care for these patients. Um, we're going to bring up our next audience response question here. Okay, in my current institution, we manage post-op pain in TORS patients with, and you can choose as many as you feel appropriate, uh, NSAIDs, opioids, steroids, biofeedback, and Carol Lewis's favorite, tough love. And so, so far we have almost everyone responding with opioids. And uh, so 90% opioids, 75% steroids, 62% NSAIDs, and I love it, 5% with some tough love. All right, Dan, I think that brings us to you on pain. Thank you, let me get my screen up. Sorry, everyone's faces are in my way of the share screen but, or the button there. Okay, can you all see that? Uh, well, thank you. Um, I'm Dan Clayberg uh, from Oregon Health Sciences University in the, uh, Portland, VA. Um, and uh, I don't have any disclosures, uh, but thank you very much to the HS and uh, for the invitation to talk here and to Intuita for their support for this uh, uh, seminar series. So, um, Pain control after TORS is really a, a critical component of caring for these patients and a, um, a very difficult thing to, um, to address, really. I think we've all seen with TORS, you know, just that picture up at the top, that we put big holes in the back of people's throats and it, it hurts a lot. And, you know, the surgical pain is a little bit different than uh, what some of our other colleagues that treat head and neck cancers deal with. Radiation, I like to think of as kind of a a slow burn where there's a, a, a crescendo and a decrescendo. 
that these patients have. Whereas surgical pain, you go from zero to 60 all at once or zero to 100, and then it, it slowly tapers off over time. Um, but we really need to immediately be able to start addressing patient surgical pain. Um, and as Dr. Lewis showed, and there's gonna be a little bit of overlap in some of the slides in my talk, um, being able to address this pain is really uh, a critical component of how we care for these patients. Uh, so we have a lot of different options, um, and this is only a partial list, uh, but probably some of the most widely used things. Opioids, obviously at the top of the list. Um, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, uh, so our NSAIDs, uh, acetaminophen or Tylenol, gabapentin, corticosteroids, uh, topical medications like uh, topical lidocaine, and then um, other non-pharmacologic inter interventions, expectation management, psychosocial interventions. Uh, so when you look at opioids, and, and Dr. Holcomb uh, alluded to this a bit, this I thought was a very interesting figure out of a recent uh, publication uh, showing the amount of opioids just prescribed nationally. If you go back to 2006, you see a few outlier states um, in some areas of the country where they're giving a lot of opioids, other areas not so much. And then you go fast forward just four years, you know, just the rapid shift in how many more opioids were prescribed. And then fast forward again to 2017, so just a couple of years ago. And now we're actually at a, a level lower than we were back in 2016. So we certainly just over the last uh, 15 years or so, I've seen the pendulum sw swing one direction and probably back the other direction on how we want to use uh, opioids and using opioids. And this is across all patients. Um, but even better than having a historical slide to start your talk is to quote your panel moderator. And so um, Dr. Richmond and his group uh, did a very nice study looking at opioid usage uh, following TORS uh, for oropharyngeal cancer. And um, as with most of these studies, this is looking at um, MMEs, so morphine milligram equivalents. And you can see that with escalating amounts of therapy, so you add on TORS and then you add on adjuvant therapy with radiation or chemo radiation, there's a lot more prescriptions for opioids that are being given. Um, and the TORS alone patients primarily are just getting their opioids up front in the first three months after uh, surgery or after treatment. But you can see that they're kind of averaging about four to 500 MMEs um, in that period. And that escalates up even more in the ones that are getting adjuvant uh, therapy. Uh, but that can be much more prolonged in the patients that are getting uh, chemo radiation as well as with radiation. Um, the average opioid usage in the 12 months after TORS is uh, almost you know, 1,400 MMEs. And then we can compare that to some of the other kind of common uh, ENT surgeries out there. And these are more for prescriptions, not necessarily what's being used, but tonsillectomy falls in the 150 to 185 MMEs. Um, you know, other sort of head and neck, uh, you know, sinus surgery, ear surgery, around 100 MMEs, thyroid, parathyroid, 125 MMEs. And really that's kind of prescription that are given. And in, in a lot of cases, sometimes those patients aren't even utilizing opioids. Um, but I think it's very clear with, you know, the um, surgery that we're doing with TORS that these patients do require at least some opioids. But um, as was discussed a bit by Dr. Holcomb, uh, it, it, is, it is good to try and minimize um, the amount of opioids that we're using for these patients. And we can do that with some of our other agents. Um, Cox, Cox inhibitors uh, have been around for a long time. Uh, NSAIDs, which we're very familiar with, uh, inhibit, um, as we're probably all familiar with, cyclooxygenase one and two. Uh, but we also have Cox two specific inhibitors uh, that have the advantage of avoiding some of the, the Cox one pathway, particularly the platelet, platelet function and the bleeding risks that we associate with traditional NSAIDs. Um, so these uh, drugs can be given pre-op, post-op, or both. Um, they have very comparable pain control to other um, NSAIDs, uh, but a lower risk for GI bleeding, renal injury, and platelet inhibition. Uh, some people have traditionally been a little gun shy with some of these uh, due to some of the issues that came out with uh, rofecoxib back in uh, 2004, where there were uh, serious cardiovascular events, and this, this drug actually was withdrawn from the market. Uh, but uh, other ones are still out there and celecoxib is, is probably the most common one that I see and we use commonly. 
Uh, gabapentin is another uh, very familiar drug to most physicians. It's used for a wide variety of different conditions, um, but uh, very widely used for neuropathic pain. And uh, this was a very nice um, randomized placebo-controlled trial that was done um, looking at uh, the use of these. This was in um, just head and neck mucosal surgery. So not tour specific, but uh, still very close. And uh, you can see that they had uh, overall you know, 90 patients that went into this trial and were, were analyzed overall. And they did a very nice job examining these patients across the first three days after surgery, um, which is the time period where they were giving the gabapentin. They gave a preoperative dose and then treated those patients for up to 72 hours with gabapentin and tested them both in, um, in a resting state, but both with coughing and swallowing. And you can see uh, sort of across the board that the um, patients that got gabapentin in the yellow uh, were doing better on their VAS scores compared to those that just got the placebo medication. So there's definitely some utility in utilizing gabapentin um, in kind of a, a shorter compressed time period around the time of surgery. Uh, corticosteroids uh, are another sort of tried and true medication that have been around for some time and um, are certainly pretty standard uh, to be used uh, around the time of uh, surgery for tonsillectomy, at least uh, in the perioperative period uh, or at the time of surgery. Uh, we also did a very similar trial to that last one, a randomized control trial of corticosteroids, but specific to TORS. Um, uh, we did this at OHSU just a few years ago and uh, enrolled uh, just shy of 80 patients for this, but uh, I'm sorry, about 70 patients for this. Uh, that we were able to analyze. And uh, we treated them with dexamethasone at surgery and then continued them on, on relatively high dose dexamethasone for four days and compared that to placebo. Um, when you looked at their, actually their, their VAS pain scores, uh, we actually didn't see that much difference until you got out to about post-op day three, where then the uh, steroid treated patients uh, appeared to be doing better. Um, it would have been nice if we could have followed this out farther, but we didn't want to start overlapping with you know, where patients were starting to be discharged and it became much, much messier to measure their pain scores after that. Uh, but what we did see that was uh, pretty significant was that the corticosteroid group uh, discharged from the hospital faster than the placebo group on average about a day earlier. Uh, so it did seem to be very useful in kind of getting those patients moving along on their recovery faster than just the placebo. Um, this is actually a very interesting study. It was done by one of my colleagues at OHSU, uh, Ryan Lee, and he partnered up with uh, Jason Chan, uh, who's uh, head and neck surgeon in Hong Kong. Um, and they were just looking at the utilization of opioids in patients that are undergoing head and neck, major head and neck surgery and compared our OHSU patients to the patients at uh, Chinese University of uh, uh, Hong Kong. And uh, I think that's the, uh, what's C-U-H-K acronym stands for, if I remember exactly. Um, they looked at uh, uh, several different types of uh, pain medication. When you look at the non-opioids, very similar utilization of NSAIDs, anxiolytics, uh, Tylenol. They had a little bit more use of tramadol in Hong Kong compared to in Oregon, uh, but it wasn't really specific. It was you know, five to 10% of patients. But then when you look at the opioid utilization, I mean, it was very astounding the difference um, that most of our patients in Oregon, as you'd expect after major head and neck surgery, were getting opioids, you know, post-op day six. Um, virtually none of the patients in Hong Kong got opioids. I mean, it's quite uncommon to see odds ratios of 1600 in a study. So, and this is just a graphical representation of this. And so, you know, there's a lot of different potential factors for, for why this could be the case, uh, different you know, cultural factors, expectations of the patients going in, but there didn't really pharmacologically seem to be a lot that was different um, between these types of patients. And the, and the types of surgeries were, were relatively similar as well. So um, these kinds of things can be done with fairly minimal opioids, but uh, they're, they're at, at the very least, I know in, in talking with Dr. Chan, there seems to be a very different mindset sometimes to these patients in Hong Kong that are approaching these larger types of surgeries compared to our patients uh, in the United States, or we're just very opioid happy in Oregon. But uh, 
I think that would be very similar if you compare to other US institutions. And then there's other uh, you know, alternative pain management tools, biofeedback, meditative practice, acupuncture, virtual reality. Uh, these have all been explored in a lot of other uh, surgical settings. Um, there's actually not a lot within the head and neck literature looking at this. Um, this is a, there's actually a, one of our residents, Vivek Pendrangi is working with uh, Dr. Lee um, on sort of a pilot project uh, for our, some of our head and neck cancer patients at OHSU. Um, and this is one of our patients in this uh, virtual reality setup. And I'm not sure exactly what the game is that they play. Um, and to some extent, the game is, is kind of immaterial. It's essentially a distractor. And it's something to you know, get that patient essentially out of their, their hospital room, thinking about something else, not thinking about how much their throat hurts. Um, and you can see just with their, their pilot data, this is you know, preliminary and is unpublished at this point, but um, you know, the virtual reality patients are using less opioid on average than the control patients in the few hours after they're doing the VR. Uh, so, you know, potentially useful thing. And, and, you know, these VR setups are actually becoming more and more common. You can now, you know, buy these commercially and hook them up to your phone and play things. So it's uh, something that very much is possible um, these days. And it's, and it's something that we can, is gonna be easier and easier probably to incorporate into our practice. Uh, so when you kind of take all these things together, what does this look like uh, as you try and put this together? And again, here is this ERAS protocol from Rush that's already been discussed. And uh, Dr. Lewis did a very nice job going through this. Uh, the um, pain control regimen is definitely uh, one of the um, uh, linchpins to these sorts of ERAS protocols. And as was previously mentioned, these patients are utilizing, that undergo ERAS protocol are utilizing less um, less opioid, uh, they're getting less opioid prescriptions and they're discharging, they're getting up and moving around faster. Um, and they're, um, just overall, um, advancing their, their recovery a lot faster. And the uh, pain control is a very important thing to this, uh, entire, uh, program. As a second example, this is another study that Dr. Lewis also mentioned. This was the, um, study of just looking at a comprehensive pain strategy. This uh, was done in Europe and comparing their patients undergoing tonsillectomy to their uh, uh, patients that underwent TORS. And they created this pain regimen that um, I've outlined here. Uh, so preoperatively, gabapentin plus a COX-2 inhibitor. Intraoperatively, a huge whopping dose of steroid. Uh, and then postoperatively, a combination of uh, paracetamol, so Tylenol equivalent, uh, again, they're COX-2 inhibitor. They do get an opioid. Uh, they get uh, dexamethasone. And then they also have uh, another um, uh, kind of rescue opioid, opioid available. Opioid available. They also standardize the regimen for their tonsillectomy patients. Um, I didn't, for the sake of space, put it up here, but it was much less intensive. Uh, but they're, again, based on v VAS scores, their TORS group is pretty equivalent to tonsillectomy. Um, across uh, the first three weeks. So they are able to bring this down to a fairly manageable level with this sort of comprehensive pain strategy. So, you know, to conclude this, you know, TORS hurts, TORS really hurts. Uh, and, you know, not to say that it hurts more or less than some of our other head and neck surgeries, but there's a big raw hole in the back of the patient's throat that takes several weeks to heal. So multimodality pain management is really crucial to this. Um, and uh, systematic pain management pathways really need to incorporate both preoperative counseling uh, along with pre and post procedure medications um, and a combination of both uh, pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic methods. Um, but you know, putting in the effort to kind of put together this sort of program can save costs and speed patients recovery. And that is it, thank you very much. Dan, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I mean, I think it's remarkable that um, in this presentation, you showed um, what's happening in Hong Kong, um, where they're not using any opioids, or almost none. And then you showed what's happening in my institution, where we're doing, what, 1,500 morphine equivalents um, within the first year um, for these patients. And then the ERAS protocol from Rush in the middle, whereas, um, you know, opioids only if necessary. So, you know, we certainly have a long ways to go. 
Um, but I think it's, you know, it's absolutely critical that we as a profession learn how to manage these patients and reduce the amount of opioids they're getting. So I think it's really interesting, the use of gabapentin and some of these other non um, opioid um, medications to try and get these patients by comfortably. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, so before, um, I know some uh, chat questions may be coming in. We're gonna address those in our discussion session at the end. Uh, I wanna bring up our last audience response question. And we heard a bit about this before in uh, Andrew's survey, um, but at my current institution, we involve SLP, one, before surgery, two, after surgery as an inpatient, three, after surgery as an outpatient, and four, as an, uh, on an as-needed PRN basis. So we'll give this a, another 10 seconds or so as the tallies come in. All right, we'll end it in three, two, one. And I'm sure this data is gonna be very interesting to Allison. Um, so 48% of institutions involve SLP before surgery, 24% after surgery as an inpatient, 10% as an outpatient, and then um, almost 20% as an on-needed basis. So with that, Allison, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, and on the heels of what Dr. Richmond just said, if you go away remembering anything from what I said in this 10 minute presentation, it's get your SLP involved at the onset of the patient's diagnosis, whether it's TORS or um, any, any head and neck cancer. And hopefully um, what I will say in this discussion will, will encourage you to think about that. So let me just see if I can advance my slides. I'm not advancing. There we go. I have no disclosures. So the standard of care for oral pharyngeal cancers is radiation therapy with or without chemotherapy. With HBV-related disease, the face of head and neck cancer has changed, and we are seeing our patients are younger, thus they're living longer, and they have more curable disease. So with that, treatment paradigms have shifted to promote best short-term and long-term function. And we, all, we know all too well how devastating the effects of radiation can be on swallowing structures in the short and long term. And this can lead to fibrosis, lymphedema, aspiration pneumonia, G-tube dependence, which is why robotic surgery for low to intermediate risk cancers of the oropharynx is a really warm welcome. This is just an example of a video swallow study of a patient who was diagnosed with HPV-related disease of the tonsil treated with chemo RT 15 years ago. And unfortunately, despite heroic efforts from the patient and multiple, multiple providers, he is not able to swallow safely. Dilation, swallowing exercises, Botox injections, we've thrown the kitchen sink at him and he cannot swallow safely and he's G-tube dependent and he's in his mid sixties. So in low to intermediate risk oral pharyngeal cancers, we know swallowing outcomes can be predicted by T-stage, nodal disease. There's an increased risk with swallowing dysfunction when base of tongue is the primary and then the need for adjuvant therapy. And obviously the cancer dictates the care, but if a patient has undergone upfront surgery and the path is favorable, we really hope that the adjuvant treatment plan is adjusted for this. So as been stated in a couple of the talks today, there's a recent um, 
accepted publication from our team that retrospectively looked at 138 patients that underwent tours for oropharyngeal cancer. And out of the 138 patients, only 13 of those patients required a feeding tube. Um, uh, 13% of these patients required a form, some form of non-oral nutrition after their surgery. So it kind of made us reflect, uh, looking back at the beginning of when um, we started to do more TORS um, surgeries at our institution, a perioperative NG tube was placed in all of the patients. And we, we stepped back and really looked at, we, you know, if we develop a strong dysphagia pathway, these patients don't necessarily need that NG tube placed intraoperatively. And we really get our patients eating close to post-up day one, and they, um, and you know, an NG tube is placed on an as-needed basis. So since 2016 at our institution, we put together a pathway to um, standardize our care for patients after tours, um, for swallowing management. We've, we've seen about 200 cases since 2016, and um, we've modified this pathway accordingly with kind of our growing pains and what we've learned from um, kind of assessing our success and failures. So we, you know, this is the current, current pathway, which has been working quite well for us. We see all of our patients preoperatively. So the SLP is consulted, we perform a standard video fluoroscopic swallow study, and we have the patient fill out the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory. And at the time of the evaluation, we're also providing patient and family counseling and education. And that's really the big piece, setting the expectation of what's to come. You know, they hear that TORS hurts, but you know, how, what, are, what are we gonna, gonna do to help them through the pain? We go through paperwork that they're going to also receive um, in the hospital that goes through expectations with diet. We tell them to pull the blender out because you're going to be on a puree diet for two weeks. Getting them prepared for the types of medications that they're going to be taking. And we found that if repetition, repetition of the same information is more likely to stick if they just keep hearing it over and over again. We then see the patient post-op day one for a clinical swallow assessment. We rarely do a video fluoroscopic swallow study at this point. We, um, it's more on a patient by patient basis. We expect changes in swallowing. We don't just expect pain, we expect changes in function. And typically what we see is we see, you know, depending where the defect is, whether it's the base of tongue or the palatine or pharyngeal area, patients are going to have residue in that region. It's going to feel different. Patients may experience retroflow of material going into the nose, and some patients do experience aspiration. And we typically see that they have the hardest time managing water. Water doesn't hold together, splashes everywhere. So many patients are placed on, you know, you, we implement swallowing strategies to help navigate the bolus in a safer way, a head tilt, a head rotation. Some patients leave on a modified diet with thick liquids. They typically transition back to thin liquids within a week, but it's important to identify those patients that require some of those modifications immediately post-op. We also go through all of the um, information about taking their pain medications, why it's important. I found that when you go into their room and you ask, are you in pain? The first thing they say is no. I said, go ahead and swallow. Are you in pain? And then that reveals, you know, the, the acknowledgement that yes, there's pain. So it's really important to stay ahead of it and adhere to the protocol that they're given to take the medications they need so that they don't develop dehydration, malnutrition, and get readmitted. We also see the patients six weeks after surgery and we perform a second video um, swallow study and we administer the MDADI. And when that also gives us time to prepare for sort of the next step of education and counseling if they require adjuvant therapy. If the patient is coming to our facility for adjuvant therapy, we follow the patient every week through radiation therapy. And we then apply swallowing exercises based on that specific patient's need. 
We then follow the patient six to eight weeks after treatment has completed with a repeat video swallow study and the MDaddy. And then we try our hardest to get them back a year and two years after. It's hard sometimes, patients live far away and a lot of people are doing really well, so they don't wanna come back. This is an example of the um, information we give the patients for following their pain management. So this is just a sample of the um, schedule that we give them. And we made it so that it's repetitive and really simple to follow because it can be incredibly overwhelming to have all these different medications being taken at very different time points. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out is we really try to emphasize using viscous lidocaine, especially right before you eat, gargle with it, swallow a little bit of it, and it can really help kind of get them through that, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of really discomfort, real discomfort when eating and drinking. So a few years back, we wanted to see how well we were doing. So we put this pathway together. Was it really working? What the information we were giving the patients, was it realistic? So we, um, we looked at two time points. So we took 22 patients that had undergone tours for oropharyngeal cancers. And we looked at their video swallow studies using the digest. So the digest is, um, stands for the dynamic imaging grade of swallowing toxicity. And it is a validated tool to measure safety and efficiency of swallowing function during video fluoroscopy. So we used, um, the, we use safety and efficiency grades, and we found that pre-tours, safety was pretty much normal, right? But 14 days post-tours, we found that the safety dips a little bit, but not by much. What we did find was there was a bigger discrepancy with efficiency, which makes sense. So efficiency, pre-tours, normal. Post-tours, but, you know, like I said, we expect that the flow of the bolus is going to be different because there's this healing defect. We also administer the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory, which is a validated self-administered um, tool to assess dysphagia effects and quality of life in patients with head and neck cancer. And we found at the two time points pre-tours, the patients scored mostly 100%. The higher the score, the better the patient perceives their swallowing. And there's a slight dip. 14 days, expected. So general takeaways, it's really important to involve your SLP right at the beginning. I think if you don't look at us as a barrier, you look at us as somebody who's gonna help guide the patient through this experience, provide education, expectation. You're also establishing a baseline so that you know the risk factors. Some patients have baseline dysphagia. It's important to identify those patients so then you know how careful you have to be with them postoperatively. And we know that swallowing function can be excellent after robotic surgery, depending on patient, you know, small T, restricted to the oropharynx, limited soft palate and pharyngeal wall resection. But then truly, truly, if your adjuvant therapy is de-escalated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Allison, that was great. I'm, I'm just going to reiterate what you said, is that get SLP involved beforehand. And you know the argument that um, I hear um, from other surgeons um, is what we know is that many of these patients, most of these patients are gonna be swallowing fine and they're gonna do great. And um, do we need to eat up the resource of SLP um, to have you know, functional swallows and this and that um, for this patient population when we know that 90% of them are gonna do great? And I think as, as you demonstrated in your talk, the answer is a resounding yes, because it's not just about swallow. It's about education and setting expectations and, um, and making sure, one, that they're starting off with a good swallow, um, that they have the family support uh, to get through this, and et cetera. And so we give them that educational packet that you discussed. And um, I think you know, the reason that our results are what they are and that we use a feeding tube so rarely is not because of me and the other surgeons. It's obviously because of you and Tessa and Rachel and the whole MGH team that is so invested in the patients here. So. Um, I think that's a, a really critical point for the listeners here. 
Um, on that note, um, I'm going to thank all of our panelists um, for a really great uh, discussion. We do have um, we have no time, but it doesn't matter because um, we can go late and this is recorded. So um, there's one question here um, from the University of Arkansas. Um, any concern over increased bleeding risk if, uh, if Tordal is used? And so maybe Dan, I can direct that to you um, as I think that came in during your talk. Yeah, I would, I would avoid the use of Toradol. I think that there's enough other options to utilize. Um, and this is probably something if you kind of sit down and work you know, with your partners that are doing tours and trying to standardize things in your institution to, to come up with a, a pain management strategy, you know, instead of, then it's not gonna come up where you know, the anesthesiologist asks you, oh, can I give them some Toradol? Because I think this might hurt. And you guys are gonna know what what you want to do and and i think that utilizing things like gabapentin and a cox2 inhibitor immediately preoperatively and then intraoperatively um a corticosteroid and you know iv uh acetaminophen are, are probably a better route to go uh to get really effective non-opioid pain management in the immediate perioperative period rather than uh, jumping into tour at all because i think that there is probably some bleeding risk with that great thanks carol i had a question for you because i thought it was really interesting how you were describing eras as being um almost a kind of local or organic product of the institution that you're working in whereas when i initially thought of eras i thought okay there's just one head and neck free flap eras that every program should be using because that's best level evidence but what you've you've argued is that that may not be the case so, so I, so in, in trying to put this talk together, I took out, you know, it, so if you look at Joe Dort's paper, 24 recommendations, um, there were a lot that he, that they recommended that we actually didn't incorporate. So one of the big things that I didn't get into with ERAS is something called prehabilitation. Um, and we looked into trying to do that. And we were, our PMNR physical medicine and rehab group essentially was like, we can't, we can't handle the bandwidth. We can't do that. And um, another recommendation is um, post-operative pulmonary, uh, pulmonary PT. Um, and uh, our group was like, we can't handle 30 patients a month, like standing orders. Um, and so you really have to work within the resources. Um, that systematic review of meta-analysis out of um, Penn is really nice. They have this awesome uh, grid where they have check marks for which programs had what components and no one program had all components. So it, it, you really have to work with in your institution, institu institutional culture. You know, with the Toral question, I was thinking of how when we put our program together, and again, this is not tours, it's free flaps, but um, for our goal-directed fluid therapy program, our plastic surgeons were like, whoa, we don't want, we don't want vasopressors, like that's not okay for our microvascular reconstructions. And what we ended up doing was one of our plastic surgeons went back, initially it was a, a review of 700 cases, found that in, in like 85% of cases, anesthesia was giving vasopressors with or without the surgeon's knowledge. Um, and they there was no difference in outcome. And they eventually expanded that for publication to about 5,000 um, free flaps, all sites, not just head and neck. But again, 85% were getting vasopressors and did find no, no difference in flap outcomes. And so I think that when you have these questions, if there are not definite answers, you can draw on your institution's experience, your group's experience, but you can also reflect on why we do the things we do. And um, it's a good time to question these things and build these protocols. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's support as um, Dr. Clayberg pointed out for gabapentin use and head and neck surgery post-operatively. Um, but in ERAS, actually there's, it's been a big discussion in groups because in other sub sites and subspecialties, gabapentin has been shown to increase um, post-operative drowsiness and not shown the benefit for pain control um, that you would expect. And so a lot of groups, even at our institution, have dropped it. So you really have to, it's this shifting um, paradigm, but you have to work within the culture of your institution and what resources are available to you. Thanks. So Andrew, you were the, I think, the most recent graduate here and um, recently moved to a new institution. Um, and so I'm curious what your experiences have been 
starting up tours there. Was there a tours culture there before, um, or did you find that you had to kind of, uh, you know, recreate what you had learned before at a new institution? Um, there are two other surgeons here that do tours. Um, so there was already a pretty well-established tours program uh, and a, a great you know, relationship with radiation and medical oncology. Uh, we also have three speech language pathologists that see patients preoperatively, postoperatively. Um, so there was already, a, I think, a very robust program here. And uh, the group uh, that I'm with has, has put out several publications on use of multimodal analgesia in a variety of settings in head and neck surgery. So it was a great uh, environment to join. Um, certainly, there were some things that you know we were doing differently at Ioneer than here. That um, you know we're kind of figuring out where we're going to uh, merge those practices. And I think we use a bit more steroids at Ioneer, um, kind of a similar protocol to what uh, Daniel presented. And um, you know we actually sent patients home with a uh, short steroid taper. Um, and so that's not something that they've been doing here, but. Um, it's been a nice uh, environment to, you know, kind of see what other people are doing here and, and figure out where where we find commonalities and and how to look at the evidence that's existing to try to you know give these patients the best outcomes. Wonderful. All right. Well, with that, um, in the late hour, at least here in Boston, uh, we're going to close it up. Um, I want to thank all the panelists again. Um, a lot of work went into this, and I'm really appreciative of each of you guys taking the time to put this together. Uh, another thanks to the AHNS team um, for all of your support through this. A big thanks to Intuitive. Again, uh, without, we couldn't have done uh, this program, and we're hoping to keep these things going into the future. And um, we really look forward to seeing you all again virtually next week, where there'll be uh, more panels about tours and a lot more interesting things from the AHNS. Um, there is going to be a survey that's sent out uh, to everyone. Um, and please, we encourage you to fill out the survey and give us feedback so we can make programs like this um, all the better in the future. So with that, uh, we can close it out. Thank you and good night, everyone.